Anthony Blinken in, in an interview with 60 Minutes said that if Russia wins in Ukraine, that would send the wrong message to any potential aggressor out there. Allowed what Russia is doing in Ukraine to go forward with impunity, then it's a Pandora's box that opens up. Mm. And every would-be aggressor around the world will say, well, if they can get away with it, uh, I can get away with it too. That's a recipe for a world in conflict. Hey, my question is that what they can do about it? Nothing is the short answer. You know, um, Blinken and the United States, frankly, need to look in a mirror uh, because they keep projecting onto Russia what is the actual actions of the United States. The United States, not Russia, has been involved with the military invasions of dozens of countries over the last 30 years. So, but, but not Russia. The only thing Russia has done is where there was unrest on its immediate borders. It took military action after it was attacked by the, in Georgia. And then after there was this uh, buildup of forces in Ukraine, with Ukraine getting ready to attack uh, the Russian-speaking civilians in the Donbass last February. So uh, Blinken... Uh, it's always better for him to point the finger of blame than to accept responsibility for the, the United States' own failings. The U.S. politicians, they were talking for years, they were talking, Assad must go, Assad must go. He must go. Assad needs to go. Assad must go. Assad must go. Assad must go. We are still saying Assad has to go. Assad has to go. Assad has to go. And I'm confident that Assad will go. Assad must ultimately go. Our position on Assad has not changed, that he must go. Assad uh, must go. And Assad must go. Assad should go. Assad will still have to go. Assad is a war criminal and should go. Assad is on his way out. Assad Lassad is finished. Our goal and focus remains an end to uh, Assad's rule. So, well, what do you want us to do about Assad? Take him out? Well, um, uh, well, how, how are we going to do that? By fighting Assad, who turned out to be a lot tougher than she thought, and now she's going to say, oh, he loves Assad. She's just, he's just much tougher and much smarter than her and Obama. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, the United States emerged from World War II as the most powerful nation in the world because it had not suffered any of the enormous horrific damage uh, to both human life and to uh, you know cities infrastructure that countries like Russia and China had endured i mean you know russia and china between them had like uh, close to 60 million casualties uh, killed uh, as a consequence of that war and vast swaths of uh, china and Russia were uh, were destroyed in, in, in part of that war. The United States didn't have that. So you'd think that the United States would have had the good grace to have used its powerful position to promote peace around the world. But instead, it has become, uh, you know, very much the, the most aggressive nation in the world for carrying out military activities against other countries. We have Politico is talking about Ukraine's plan if Russia assassinates Zelensky. Why would Russia do that? Because he's not popular inside right. Ukraine <clears throat> nor outside. You know, it seems that U.S. officials don't like him right now. That he has some conflict between between him and Poland and the, the officials in the United States. What? How do you see this? Yeah, this uh, this again is more projection. I think this is part of a Western propaganda effort that uh, they know that they're going to kill or eliminate Zelensky one way or the other. So they'd like to blame it on Russia if possible. Again, they don't want to take responsibility for what they're going to do. Uh, I don't think, I frankly, I don't think Zelensky is long for power. I think his days are numbered. You know, talking about this counteroffensive, we see that this British intelligence report talking about growing shrubs and weeds that yeah, are causing problems for Ukraine in, in this counteroffensive. How legitimate is this excuse for, for Ukrainian? You know, 
Do you, are you familiar with the term a weed whacker? So, you know, it's a, it's a implement, a tool that with a spinning filament at the bottom that will cut down weeds. Who knew that all the United States had to do to ensure the success of Ukraine's counteroffensive was to provide it with a brigade of weed whackers so they could have gone out there and cut down all the weeds. I mean, it, this is so nonsensical that you've got to wonder how in the world can professional military or alleged professional military people in Britain say something so stupid, so so incredibly ignorant that you know, they want to blame it on, on summer growth. Please. New York Times published a paper claiming that the tactics Ukrainians are using, they are considering those old tactics instead of these new tactics that, that these Western trained soldiers have been provided. How do you say this? It, 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 it's a fundamental misunderstanding of what's going on on the ground. Uh, the, there is no way a Ukrainian counteroffensive could work and succeed, whether or not it's following, quote, NATO tactics or Ukraine's tactics. Because regardless of whether they're massing a, group, a large number of forces and focusing an attack on one sector, or they're taking small groups of people and throwing them out like mosquito bites along that line, that there, there is just an immutable reality, which is Ukraine does not have fixed-wing combat aircraft that can approach the front lines, that can bomb Russian positions. It does not have long-range artillery that can accomplish that same mess, uh, mission. And it certainly doesn't have any attack helicopters uh, because Russia shoots them down if they come within range. So without them, it doesn't matter what Ukraine does. It cannot penetrate the Russian lines. The Russian lines, think of this. They started constructing these last October. And we know that Western intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance uh, satellites and, and fixed-wing air platforms were collecting photographs, video. They were collecting electronic information. They knew who was where doing what. And at no time in that entire period did Ukraine launch any attacks on the construction workers building those uh, fortifications. That's crazy. Because if you can see someone building something like that, then you can certainly send something to destroy it, or should be able to. So the fact that Ukraine couldn't even do that is just a reminder of how desperate their situation is. Because with their current counteroffensive now going on entering the third month, uh, they have been unable to bro uh, breach any, any of the Russian defensive lines, the, the gray zones that are extend out in front of the first defensive line. Not a one. And Russia, by contrast, is making some advances, uh, particular, particularly in the north. So it's, you know, it's just a, it's a situation that, Nobody wants to face the reality that Ukraine, without combat air, without mobile air defense systems, without mobile artillery, has no chance, no ability to uh, defeat Russia. Larry, we had a French analyst that has he has published his his article talking about this counteroffensive. He says that. The Ukrainian military lost something like 62 square kilometers in this counteroffensive. But what we see from the mainstream media, they're talking about Ukrainian gaining kilometers by kilometers. Well, you know, this, I think measuring wins and losses in terms of this terrain is not really a smart thing to do because if you've seen any of the images, these are vast, vast fields for farmers. You know, either they're growing wheat, uh, maybe growing corn. They got cattle, but it's uh, it's not like you're taking back critical geographic locations. It is 
uh, driving across a lot of empty landscape with a few scattered villages here and there. So it's, uh, it'd be one thing if Ukraine had actually advanced 10 kilometers into the Russian lines. The, the problem they're going to face is if they do that, if they make that kind of penetration, they're going to be attacked from the sides by the Russians. They'll envelop whatever force has gone forward and, and crush it or kill it or destroy it. I don't know if you saw these flyers in the U.S. They're trying to recruit mercenaries among the U.S. students to pay their loans. Oh. How, how is that possible? Hey, if you, if you want to be named Hop Along Cassidy when you sign up and go over, because the odds are that uh, these mercenaries are going to lose arms and legs. They'll come back with uh, amputations. And, and, for, and for what? Uh, because Ukraine does not have the military power, the manpower, the equipment, the funds to sustain this war and to come out on top. We heard that from, from an, an African leader, we heard that those, those weapons that were sold to Ukraine were stolen, I don't know, they are appearing in Africa mm -hmm. right now. And we know that in Niger has happened a coup. How do you see these, these geopolitical changes in Niger? Well, it's not just Niger. It's uh, uh, Mali and Burkina Faso as well have had coups of, over the last couple of years. So, you know, with them being unlikely to get conventional military aid from the United States or even the Europeans, uh, they could very well be turning to the black market because there is an enormous amount of equipment out there that could be readily transferred and people get paid for it. We heard that Nigeria is sending troops to, to confront this coup in Niger. Do you think, on the other hand, we heard that Wagner Group is signing a contract with, with this military in Niger. How do you see this, this confrontation between Nigeria and Niger having this Wagner, Wagner group on their side? Yeah, it's just another opportunity for a proxy war in which the uh, U.S. is backing one side, Russia backs the other, and they can fight it out. And then the other, the sponsoring company, can take credit for the victory, whatever that is. We had this second Russia-Africa summit in St. Petersburg in right. Russia that despite tremendous pressure from the West, they, they finally, they, it, it took place successfully. How important is, is this summit for the United States, for the West? Well, the, let's call it the summit competitions uh, is starting to demonstrate that we're in the midst of the creation of a new world order, a second world order that's outside the control of the United States and Europe. So uh, I can see certain countries begin to realign themselves. And uh, the influence of the United States in the Middle East is certainly waning. It's not increasing. So it's... Uh, you know, it's a, it's a bad situation for the United States. White House stated the new U.S. military personnel is involved in combat operation in Ukraine. Is that right? If not, why they're, why they're making such statements? Well, there are, uh, I think there have been at least five, maybe six Americans killed in battle over the last two weeks. And... Uh, you know, there, it, it looks like none of them are of active duty, that they are all former military who decided to join up because they believed in Ukraine and wanted to help Ukraine survive. On the other hand, we have this Ukrainian intelligence service that they're talking about. The head of this intelligence service said that the, the, the liberation of Crimea will not take too long. <laughs> yeah. How... How, how do you see this? They're totally detached from reality. How, how do you see this? Yeah, no, I've, look, I've, ne I've never seen anything like this on this scale of just complete, utter denial of reality. 
you know, we, we saw Baghdad Bob, as he was known in uh, Baghdad in 2000, March 2003, as uh, he kept claiming, well, the U.S. tanks are being held off and we're defeating the Americans. And meanwhile, here in the background come the tank, U.S. tanks rolling in uh, behind him. So not since then, and what we're seeing now is on just a far grander scale, the, the lies. The, the lies are gargantuan. And the consequences of those lies is being paid for with the blood of the Ukrainian. It's not just Ukrainians. We heard we heard this from Stoltenberg, from U.S. officials. They are feeding media by these lies. Who's benefiting? Who, who's benefiting from these lies? Well, the U.S. corporations that are invested in this war, that are producing military equipment and weapons. You know, there they have a strong financial incentive to keep the thing going and to keep uh, the bulk of the American people in the dark about the reality of that war. New York Times reported that there are two reports in New York Times. First, it says Europeans vowed to punish Russia for this Ukraine war economically. And the other, the other article says that Russia is in, in a very good shape economically. Yeah. Is Europe capable to punish Russia economically, militarily, whatever you, you call it? Well, Europe certainly does not have the military capability to attack and punish Russia, to defeat Russia. They have enough military force to irritate Russia and, and provoke Russia into a, a very wide and, and vicious response. So... Um, the, the Europe's problem is economics as well. Uh, Germany is being deindustrialized. De uh, they were heavily dependent upon Russia and as a cheap energy source before the start of the special military operation. Now that that option's off the table. So it is. It's just. It's. It's. You watch it. It's, it's tragic. But uh, Ukraine is losing, and. That, that flip-flop in Politico where uh, in, uh, I guess it was October or September, they're declaring, you know, the sanctions have worked and Russia's dying. And now they've come back out and said, oops, looks like Russia's succeeding. And what you see of the, uh, the images of uh, a declining Ukraine and a soaring Russia passing each other. CNN reported that majority of the U.S. citizens are something like 55% of people are opposing more aids to Ukraine. And we know that a German newspaper called Welt is, is reporting that Germany is slowing down the delivery of promised weapons. What we can get through these articles in Germany, in, in the United States, it seems to me that people in the West, in Europe, in the United States, are not happy with this war. More aid, more pouring weapons in this war. Right. Well, no, what, what you're seeing is the start of the fragmentation of NATO. You know, remember Joe Biden was expressing, oh, NATO's never been more united and NATO's never been more committed. Oh, yes, it has. It's not very united right now. And the political pressures in Germany are going to explode at some point and force uh, uh, an about face uh, on the part of uh, German leaders uh, with respect to Ukraine. So, you know, you're seeing you're seeing it on a variety of fronts that Hungary is also already raising questions. Um, I don't see any momentum developing that will put Europe into a stronger position, more able, more willing, more capable of providing Ukraine uh, assistance. It's, uh, I think the dynamic is moving in just the opposite direction. We have this conflict in Ukraine. We have now in Africa this, mm. these problems in Africa. And we, beside all these problems, we have the U.S. is transferring arms to Taiwan to, yeah. for the first time under Ukraine supply scheme. Why they're doing well, that? This is more a function of the U.S. House of Representatives who appropriates money. So... To, they wanted the, the Biden administration and congressional leaders have been wanting to send weapons to Taiwan 
uh, to sort of a way of thumbing their nose at the Chinese leaders. And this bill that was already through the process provided a, a, a vehicle that they would be able to use it to send some weapons to Taiwan while at the same time continuing support for Ukraine. So I think I think this has more to do with just the the, the, the bureaucratic politics that are uh, that dominate the U.S. Congress. I remember I was talking before midterm elections. I was talking with Jeffrey Sachs. He was so optimistic about the changes at that time that that were going to happen in the Congress. But it seems to me nothing has changed in Congress. How how, how do you see that? Yeah, no, no, there's you. There is no strong voice in Congress yet, either the House or the Senate, standing up saying, "We've got to bring an end to this war. Uh, we cannot afford this. We cannot avoid the risk." There's nobody of any substance or significance that's standing up saying, "We need to talk with Russia, and we we need to negotiate." That's not happening. So it's you know it's it's a dangerous time, simply because. There is no room in the United States for that kind of political debate. Anybody who goes on air to suggest that we ought to talk to Russia is immediately accused of being on the payroll of the Russians or a puppet of Putin or some secret agent for the uh, Foreign, Foreign Security Bureau of Russia. So it's it's it's. Very, very dangerous time in my view. We know that Saudi Arabia is inviting various countries to talk about Ukraine, what's going on in Ukraine. It seems they, they didn't invite Russia. And after that, I heard just yesterday that Brazil is not willing to send anybody there. How, wh why they're doing this? If not, if Russia is not there, <clears throat> what are they going to solve? Well, um, I don't know why Russia was excluded. Uh, there are some indications that Russia would not have attended in any event. But uh, pressure is being brought on Saudi Arabia to renounce its closer ties with the Chinese and with, uh, and with Russia and to go back and be very much at home with the United States. This case of Gonzalo Lira, yeah. uh, it's so, so everybody's talking about this. Scott said that he's a Ukrainian SBU asset. Yeah, that's crazy. I, I, so if you're going to be an asset of the SBU, you're going to be doing the work that's going to benefit the SBU, correct? Yeah. Okay. What was Gonzalo Lira doing? Well, he was hosting roundtables, regular podcasts, with a whole host of characters, including myself and the Duran and Doug McGregor. He even hosted uh, Scott Ritter at one point. And all of this was being done uh, to raise criticism of Ukraine and to point out the justified use of force by Russia. How does that serve SBU interests? I don't get it. I mean, so... What is it? I've always I've asked people this. I've yet to get a good answer, <clears throat> and I hope to ask Scott. What is it that Gonzalo Lira did that benefited the SBU? Just name me one thing. I see, because it seems to me that this division that is happening inside everybody who is criticizing. This war in Ukraine, we, we are dividing in two parts. It's some yes. I think this this is nonsense. I think at the end of the day, everybody should think about this war is more important than anything else. How do yeah. You... yeah. No, that it is. Uh, I think this is an unnecessary distraction and focusing. The only focus with respect to Gonzalo ought to be that he should be released and that he should not be uh, facing uh, any more time in prison that he needs to be freed.